Right. So today we will be discussing the M5 competition, which was held uh, this year in the beginning of the year uh, by Spiros Makrodakis and Evangelos Spiliotis. Uh, this is a continuation of the previous uh, competitions and Robert will tell a bit more about that. I personally uh, didn't participate there. I, I don't think that anyone in the center well, maybe Xiao Hui uh, did, but the rest uh, di didn't do anything for the competi com competition because uh, it is a very difficult thing and actually it's very time consuming. But we still are interested in the findings and what interesting has happened. So, so that's why we have decided to organize this event. So we start with presentation of Robert, then we will go to Xiao Hui and then uh, discussion, questions and so on. So Robert, over to you, please okay. do take control. Right, I will do that. Thanks, uh, Ivan. Um, yes, just to expand a bit on what Ivan said, um, these competitions um, starting in the 70s have proved increasingly influential. Uh, the M3 competition was held in 2001, or at least published in 2001, I think, uh, with 3000 time series. Asperos, who's been the leader in, uh, in this, um, essentially retired. And then suddenly, uh, despite his, uh, his increasing age, <laughs> I speak feelingly, uh, for myself as well, because uh, he's just a little older than me, uh, recommitted himself to produce the M4 competition. Uh, the M4 competition um, included a, a broader range of machine learning. It was an open competition, 100,000 time series, and Ivan was a contributor um, with Photos Petro uh, Petropolis to that competition. The results of these competitions are often very hard to discern. You know, there's a usual uh, head headline result, uh, but the, the devil is in the detail. And I thought, therefore, it was useful for us all to uh, think about um, and discuss what the the details of this. Now, shall we? Um, it's a bit of a cheat, really, to say it's Robert Files with Shall We. It should be a bit the opposite way around, because Shall We actually did participate in this competition fully. So he he is, I believe, number 41 on one of the slides. Uh, so he knows all about the uh, requirements, the time consuming requirements of it. Um, so what I've done, as I often do these days, is essentially try and uh, offer an interpretation from the outside rather than the inside. So that's a brief summary. Uh, that's why I did page down. There we are. Uh, what do we mean by a forecasting competition? Uh, what are they for? They're, they're essentially uh, aimed at trying to find uh, a method which dominates alternatives. It's very ambitious, really, a holy grail, if you will, uh, compared with various benchmarks. So they will evaluate and compare different methods. And as we've moved through the various competitions, starting in uh, essentially 90, the, I was involved in the 1981 M1 competition. Um, various methods were introduced. I carried out a Bayesian uh, exponential smoothing uh, uh, multiple state method in that particular competition um, through to machine learning. It, it first introduced in the M3 as well as the theta method and for more machine learnings getting increasingly open. People can make their own contributions. The data is kept aside. So a subsidiary aim is to introduce and test out new methods compared with these benchmarks and uh, with the extension to uh, open competition in machine learning in the M4 and in the M5, we've got the opportunity to try and see how these newer methods, some of them are not that new, of course, actually perform. So what are the characteristics? Many of you will have seen this slide before, but it's worthwhile reminding ourselves a population of relevant time series, uh, a defined forecasting task, the methods, of course, and measures of performance linked to value, perhaps 
the data to be used in training and testing the methods and the various error measures then used to calculate uh, and choose between the best methods. Now, note the choice is not operational. All we're really saying at the end of these calculations, even when we're using the test data, the, is that method A has shown itself to perform better method B on the test data set. Implicitly, of course, we're really seeing method A will actually continue that performance in, into the future. We are essentially trying to find, an, in my terms, an aggregate selection procedure. What about the machine learning uh, results? Uh, M3, the neural network implementation, performed poorly, but it was very specific implementation. Uh, Sven, and if Sven's in the uh, meeting, will hopefully notice that I've revised the uh, this uh, bullet point to uh, accord with his views. Um, looked at a variety of machine learning methods. I think they were mostly neural network, weren't they, Sven? Um, on a subset of the M3 data with the, uh, the conclusion that they are closed in on established benchmarks. They didn't, uh, didn't beat, uh, it's always hard to say this, but they, they had, uh, Sven saw, encouraging evidence of performance. By the time we got to Macrodacus and the M4 competition, out of the box machine learning turned out yet again to perform poorly on a subset of the M3 data. Uh, there'd been a positive evaluation, interestingly, but they, that positive evaluation done by machine learners had excluded standard benchmarks. In the M4, um, we now get a, a winner, though, because uh, it was an open competition, remember, a hybrid deep learning neural network model, which was essentially a combination uh, building on uh, exponential smoother, I think. It was proprietal, I think it still is, uh, to uh, Smeal et al. Uh, I've actually moved this slide so you can actually uh, go back, um, see the bottom line, which I cannot see any longer. So anyway, uh, um, but the conclusion, however, from this earlier work, to the, including the M4, is it really does depend on the application and particularly on the implementation of that application. And I think we'll spend a bit of time with uh, on that later on. So those are the early machine learning results. Um, the Cargill competitions have rather been overlooked by the standard statistically, econometrically dominated forecasters. Um, and in a paper coming out in the IGF, uh, they're described as an overlooked learning opportunity. What were the particularly relevant competitions? Well, they actually go back to 2014, um, where we're talking about retail sales. They're mostly retail in this particular uh, group of competitions. Um, so this essentially, well, I was about six, six competitions. What were the key finding? Well, they're mostly, the cargo community is, I think, dominated by machine learners. Uh, so we are actually looking at how machine learning performed on these various uh, data sets, which are, I believe, publicly available. Uh, the results, however, I believe are not publicly available. And certainly the algorithms are not necessarily available. Anyway, the key findings, cross learning, that is to say, uh, we're going to use uh, data gathered from the whole variety of series to forecast individual time series. So it's a, a pooling essentially of information. Um, no surprise here, external information is important. Uh, Shall and I have uh, spent quite a bit of time looking at retail data and uh, crucial to the, the analysis of it is uh, looking at the external information, in particular, the promotional information. Um, new machine learning methods actually perform well. And the use of the, I mean, in machine learning, uh, it's usual to uh, break down the data into uh, training data, validation data, and test data. And the effective use of that validation strategy to essentially uh, prune out, simplify, uh, make sure there's no overfitting, 
turns out to be uh, crucial. And finally, uh, various va variants of gradient, gradient boosting trees and also neural networks showed strong performance. So we do have, as we go into the M5, various uh, established conclusions. Now, it's important to say they're not established in the forecasting community, or at least weren't at that time. So what are the innovations then of the M5 competition? Well, and this sort of meets, uh, uh, this is a, the next slide, I think, uh, meets some of the, the objections to competitions. We do have a very clear problem. It's a large retail data set, Walmart, in fact. Uh, we've used, um, or more exactly, Macrodac and some colleagues have used many benchmarks. Uh, there's a hierarchy here, uh, as there is in any retail um, forecasting situation, where you move from SKU time store to store, or you can use to category. There are all sorts of ways of aggregating the data. So it's a large hierarchy. Uh, the data are highly correlated. Uh, multiple seasonal patterns, exogenous explanatory variable, uh, although Walmart, I think, claims to be uh, everyday low prices. Uh, nevertheless, there are promotional effects and certainly price effects. Um, and uh, importantly, and I'm going to or I think we're going to neglect this and others may wish to comment. There is a discussion uh, and uh, uh, criteria concerned with uh, distribution performance, the uncertainty. So, OK, we're talking about point forecasting accuracy, but also the distribution, the predictive distribution. Uh, what about our challenges? Well, uh, shall we can talk at some uh, degree of uh, length, I should think, but it's large scale. Um, only 10 stores note. <laughs> I don't know how many thousand stores Walmart has, but uh, you can see that we've uh, simplified the, uh, the uh, problem uh, despite the relative complexity. 3,000 SKUs, seven products, et cetera, et cetera. You can read many influential factors, however. Um, note the demand is potentially, not necessarily, intermittent at the SKU time store level. Let me remind you about the objections to forecasting competitions. Uh, after my uh, um, work on M1, I think I was more clear about the objections than the benefits. Uh, I think lack of clarity. What are we actually trying to do here? I've written um, and discussed the issue is one of advising, it seems to me, not everybody would agree this, uh, of pointing a research direction. What, it, what they do not do is tell you which method to use under what circumstance. Now, maybe this M5 competition is better on that. We'll see. Uh, results are often aggregated. So they don't tell us about the specific problem. There is no well-defined population of time series. And I've, uh, I've witted on at length about the necessity in most circumstances of using multiple time origins. So shall we and I, uh, our analysis has always had a number of cross sections where the uh, forecasts are evaluated. Uh, my 92 paper actually showed how error me comparative error measures or relative error measures can move over time over a particular population. So there is no necessity of assuming that a one off cross section is a good representation, particularly, say, in retailing. Perhaps we take Christmas, a rather specific problem. There is a single optimal method. Well, no combination, of course, has turned out to be uh, very successful. It was in the early days seemed as necessarily suboptimal, interestingly enough. Um, there were criticisms of the competence uh, or otherwise of the contributors. This applied to Macrodacus with his ARIMA modeling back in 79, and it was applied to uh, uh, Keith Ord and his colleague on neural network modeling in for the 2000 M3 competition. And one of my other obsessions, of course, is error measures. How have they been aggregated over time, over series, used a single time? I've already referred to that. And of also the issue of forecast horizon. So a series of objections. Uh, well, does the. How does. 
previously. Now, whilst the previous uh, one of the previous M5 cargo, sorry, the cargo competitions had a hierarchy, it was not really part of the material. Nor I have to say, as the, as, um, I'm a, unaware of any um, fully refereed publications relating to them, um, but I may be wrong there. Um, so we do have a well-defined population. Do we have a well-defined uh, uh, sensible error measure? Uh, I would argue not. You see the formula uh, given there. It's uh, related to maze, in, in the, uh, except it's squared errors. So it's squared errors uh, averaged over a forecast horizon of H period relative to some in-sample uh, I say it's in sample, but uh, uh, estimated on a different sample data set, the uh, errors, squared errors from the, a, a benchmark, a random walk benchmark. So in many ways, uh, we've got lots of, ben we've got a well-defined population, we've got lots of alternative uh, um, methods, uh, both benchmark and also because of the openness of the data, we have the opportunity to ensure that the results, the machine learning results in particular, are relatively robust. So it's pretty well meets some of the benchmarks. But we can actually um, uh, add up to dealing with all the ob objections. Now, what about the hierarchy? Well, the hierarchy is rather important. Uh, at the bottom level, level 12, I hope you can just about read this, You've got about 30,000 series. The top level is the aggregate. Uh, so um, in those 12, uh, you've got 30,000, 8,000, if I'm reading it correctly, 3,000, and so on. Yeah, somebody? Um, there are special events, uh, selling prices, and uh, promotional activities, and the data available as shown there. Uh, I mentioned the error measure, so uh, one element of it I, I haven't mentioned to be fairly important. The, uh, for a particular data series, so uh, this should be indexed by the series, um, they are then weighted, averaged uh, by the weight being the value of each series. So it could mean, for example, at the extremes that of that 30,000, only one or two data series are particularly important. So the weights are potentially very important. And looking to the conclusions, uh, they turn out to be actually rather critical. Um, the benchmarks. I've highlighted the ones in red because these are sort of things that we would um, pay at natural attention to the random walk, the naive and a seasonal random walk, uh, Croston's method, which may be useful for the intermittent data, uh, an intermittent demand uh, uh, version, which looks at aggregate and disaggregate intermittent data, um, Adida, exponential smoothing, of course. Now, remember the hierarchy. We can forecast at the top level of the hierarchy through a method and then one way or another, break that down to the bottom levels of the hierarchy or vice versa. So how you deal with the hierarchy may prove to be particularly important. Um, exponential smoothing can be reasonably extended to include ex explanatory variables, ESX, likewise ARIMA, ARIMAX, um, a, a basic neural network, a basic random forest, and some combining methods. So uh, an awful lot of comparisons uh, to allow us to understand uh, the results. Now, um, I didn't make it clear that the cargo competitions are open competitions. Uh, there are typical prizes. Here, I think it was $50,000 euros um, for, the, for the winner of, and uh, some subsidiary prizes for the top uh, three, I think it was. And the final part of my own presentation is just to make a point, which again, we may well come back to. Uh, you've got in this slide a diagram of uh, the uh, accuracy, 
per aggregation level. And what you see, I mean, no great surprises, as, is as you aggregate upward, uh, first you get fewer and fewer series, and uh, you get um, uh, uh, the, this, this is the uh, highest level, I believe. I hope I'm saying it correctly. The highest level of the data, and here are the lowest levels, where effectively, um, in red, you've got the machine learning methods. Uh, so um, much more uncertainty about the performance of the methods at the, the skew levels of the data. So that's the situation. Uh, um, in summary, what the results start to look like. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about machine learning results because the machine learning methods, which are essentially versions of random forest, uh, perform extremely well. So I now want to introduce Shawi. Uh, Shawi, will you uh, just tell me to move uh, move slides when you're ready? So if I move to the next slide, are you ready? I think you can also okay. take control, actually. Shawi, yeah. do you have yes. a button? I, I found, uh, yes, I found I can control the slide. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you control them. <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, as I also participated in uh, the M5 accuracy competition, so Robert wants me to share some thinking on it. Uh, my score uh, was not good, but still not too bad. Uh, rank any uh, 41st in the end. Uh, as there are many factors uh, to win a forecasting competition, some are technical and uh, experiential, and uh, also we need a uh, few lucky. Uh, for example, uh, M5 allows uh, us to use outside data, so uh, we need to uh, analyze holidays in the US. Uh, it's very different from China, so, and also uh, weather conditions, or your price, uh, even why, uh, whether there are disasters during the period, uh, the, data, the data cover. Uh, we also need to determine uh, to adapt uh, what uh, hierarchical forecasting strategies, for example, uh, bottom up, uh, top down, or reconciliation. On the modeling side, whether we need to use global or local for uh, learning methods, or using uh, meta learning, whether we need to use deep learning neural networks or regression trees. On the strategies uh, to generate multiple step ahead forecasts, we also uh, have many choices. Uh, for example, a re a recursive, uh, direct, direct, or multiple in multiple out. Uh, <clears throat> so after the competition, I read some uh, public top solutions and I hope to find uh, some keys for the winning of M5 uh, accuracy competition. So on <coughs> current uh, slide, we show that uh, the new miner WRMSSE, so this, this model is used in M5 competition. Uh, this uh, model makes the M5 a very different competition compared with previous ones. Uh, in the M5, we need to present uh, the forecast on the store, like a store item level, but uh, the accuracy score on this level only occupy a uh, uh, twice of the total. <clears throat> so the forecasts of the other 11 levels are all generated by accumulations of the store item level forecasts. This means that a more accurate forecast at the bottom level doesn't mean a better performance at higher levels. For example, the RMSSE score of the first place 
and the 21st uh, is similar is the bottom level. Uh, from this uh, table, we can <coughs> see uh, these figures. But there is the uh, uh, top level, there are uh, RMSAC score are very different. During the uh, competition, we found uh, WRMSSC is, is very sensitive. Tiny changes is the bottom level may make the huge changes on the score is top level. For example, a uh, simple judgmental multiplayer, uh, which is also called magic uh, multiplayer in the Kaggle forum, uh, on bottom forecast can make a uh, minor change over 5 percent. Uh, this is a similar difference between the first place and the 20s in the end. So in the competition, we found it is hard uh, to de determine uh, the loss function in the forecasting model. We also tried uh, the deep learning neural networks, uh, but it is really hard uh, to train. <clears throat> Uh, but I think it could be an issue worth to be further explored. <clears throat> so in uh, in the uh, winning for, uh, in the winning of uh, for uh, M five, uh, <clears throat> is it is a uh, lottery? Uh, is an interesting question. I think. In fact, the winning of most of the Kaggle uh, competitions need fortunate. So, uh, but the sensitivity of the new miner in M5 makes the lucky part bigger. This is uh, in my understanding. <coughs> so, so, this slide uh, shows that multiple uh, comparisons with the base test or top five, uh, top 50 solutions. It shows the average ranks of different solutions over all the time series in the data. We have found that the best team, according to the average rank, uh, is any the eighth place, according to the M5 measure. And the fifth of the rank, uh, average rank is the 48th of the M5 ranks. <clears throat> so this is my uh, last uh, last slide. Uh, so there is uh, some fortunate part to win uh, M5. Uh, we still uh, can learn a lot by analysis the top solutions. Uh, first, we found that almost all the top solutions use the uh, bottom-up method. Then generate forecast uh, directly at store item level. In contrast, the other strategies uh, didn't show good performance. <clears throat> this result is somewhat different with uh, the conclusions in the existing hierarchical forecasting literatures, I think. So uh, we think that existing literature may uh, neglect the benefits of global learning, which uh, can only be used as a uh, levels close to the bottom, uh, as there are much more time series than that at top levels. So the second key uh, is the uh, using of global forecasting technique. Uh, there is an increasing uh, evidence shows that the pooling of large sums of time series to learn a global model uh, can enhance uh, the forecasting accuracy due to joint learning. M5 also provide uh, a number of benchmarks models, uh, but then are uh, all uh, <clears throat> local learning models, their performance are inferior to global forecasting models significantly. <clears throat> Third, 
All the top uh, solutions adopted uh, uh, combination techniques. And there is a similar result with, this is similar, similar result with uh, many other uh, cargo competitions. Uh, this shows the uh, robust, uh, robustness of the forecasting uh, combinations. Of course, uh, we found the light GBM uh, uh, is used by almost all the top solutions. This is a similar result with previous cargo time series uh, competitions. This is uh, also indicate uh, the superior performance and the robustness of the gradient boosting tree methods. Uh, Let GBM is an open source machine learning framework developed by a team from Microsoft. Uh, compared to an another popular uh, boosting tree framework, uh, XGBoost, uh, Let the uh, Let GBM uh, usually can learn the model faster uh, when the data is big. <clears throat> so uh, another issue is uh, cross validation. Uh, this uh, I think this is uh, uh, also a very important factor in M5 competition. As we uh, cannot opti optimize uh, WRMMSC directly, so we need to use cross validation to choose model. Uh, multiple uh, <clears throat> cross validation uh, can make the choice, choosing precise, more uh, robust. The last issue <coughs> is about time series pooling for global learning. In the uh, past cargo retail uh, competitions, the winners usually uh, pull all the store items together to change a global model, but M5 is different. Uh, as we have mentioned, the 11 levels of forecast need to be accumulated. Uh, on the issue of global, uh, uh, one issue of global forecasting uh, is uh, local bias, <clears throat> which is also named regression to the mean in uh, panel regressions. When using global learning, the focus on fast moving items can be underestimated. Therefore, uh, slow moving items, the focus are generally, generally be overestimated. In the hierarchical accumulations, local bears uh, can result in lower performance on higher levels. So many uh, top solutions use the different data pooling strategies, then pull the data by stores by store departments or by store uh, categories, and then combine the forecast from different pooling strategies. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> this uh, is only some initial analysis uh, uh, result. <clears throat> so now the last uh, slide is due to uh, Robert, I think. <laughs> I'm. Can people hear me and see the slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, th then some questions uh, that, and some others that Shall we uh, has mentioned. Um, th there is clearly an effect of that error measure, and uh, Nichols may well. Um, he, I'm not sure whether he claims responsibility or influence over that. He may have some views. In fact, I'm fairly sure that Nikos will have views. Um, there are lead time effects. You know, one of the things we knew from the previous competition is that different methods perform better at different lead times. So what are those lead time effects? Um, and 
uh, uh, quite interesting. We've not actually given credit at all to the winners of this uh, the, the, this competition. I mean, they got credit enough, the, the three winners with their fifty thousand uh, dollars or whatever. But they were actually, I think, the winner was a South Korean undergraduate, wasn't he? Uh, shall we? Um, uh, it, yes. Uh, they, the, the 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 top few were people who obviously dedicated a large amount of time and had no obvious forecasting credentials. What I wonder does, does that say about us? Anyway, other people will have other questions and other comments. So let me uh, shut up now and uh, pass over to the, the uh, uh, others. So, Ivan, uh, well, yes, you, you want okay. to take that? Thanks uh, for the presentation. Uh, let me. I guess we can stop presenting, right? Yeah, so sure. it is time for questions. Uh, if you have questions, please unmute yourselves and show yourselves, and uh, we will have a discussion. One thing mm, before we move there that I want to say is a sort of defend uh, RMSS E. Uh, I, I don't know about the weighted part of it. I'm sure it has some issues. The RMSSE itself is actually not a, a bad measure given circumstances, in my opinion, because um, they deal with intermittent data, so they have to use squared values, and in some cases they have zero, so uh, it's very difficult to use any other measure. So I think they, they sort of uh, did the best they could in a quite challenging and difficult situation. Uh, Nikos has a question. Go ahead, Nikos, unmute yourself and show yourself. I, I had to take, uh, you know, Robert's uh, cue to put a comment on that. <laughs> but uh, you were actually faster than me, one of those. I, I think error measures is uh, always a funny topic. And I don't think uh, more than three academics uh, can agree on a single error measure. And probably for that, we even need to you know, force them a bit to agree. But uh, yes, I mean, we have first to think about the loss function. It should it be quadratic, should it be uh, absolute what it should be? And if we think that we are supporting a retailer here that has to take inventory decisions, a quadratic loss makes sense. The other aspect is the intermittency that Ivan also argued. I mean, and it's always a proxy. It will always have limitations. But I will probably, you know, so I will claim a bit of responsibility because I, I heavily push for quadratic measures when you support inventory decisions. And at the same time, you need to somehow get rid of the scaling factors in an equivalent uh, order of loss. But um, the other thing that I would say is that surely the way that it was implemented in M5 leads to a lot of questions. Because when we do the weighting, as uh, both you and Safi mentioned very correctly, uh, eventually it really doesn't matter what you do for most of the hierarchy. And I would arguably say that in a practical situation, and you know, this is up to Walmart if, if they want to make a comment on that actually at some point in the literature, is does it really matter at the top level in the same way that it matters in the bottom level? I don't mean in terms of importance, I mean in terms of loss. I could see an inventory decision done at the SKU level, but I cannot see an inventory decision done at the top of the hierarchy. I could see there a budget decision done. And probably there you need a different loss function. So there is this question of, should we even, you know, to me, sometimes this looks like a academic novel writing. We always do a horse race. Should we do a horse race or should we think, actually, from the whole hierarchy, you need that level for this decision, that's your loss function, that level for that decision, that's your loss function. And maybe one method wins there, maybe another method loses somewhere else. And that's okay. Thanks for the comment, Nikos. Yeah. Uh, any comments? Any other comments? Any other suggestions? Uh, Sven, uh, I know that you don't uh, didn't raise your hand, but you had uh, uh, some comment in the chat. Uh, was it about an N3, or would you want to comment, maybe? Oh yeah, it's. It was just on on what Robert on Robert's points on the NN3, which was a subset of the M3, where where we showed that basically the the finding was that on monthly data you can't really improve. We've done other public we've done other competitions uh, in the IEEE where it was quite clear that uh, um, you know neural networks, machine learning, statistical 
data. So I think that's often um, often omitted from the discussion in the international uh, um, in the forecasting uh, communities or in the econometrics communities. But when it comes to electricity load forecasting, really commercial systems with with machine learning have prove their worth for, for, for you know, decades already in production and routinely outperform uh, simpler statistical methods. I mean, there are much more advanced statistical methods as well, but I think the complexity kind of like seems to be on par uh, of the complexity of the algorithm with the complexity of the, um, of the task at hand and the data available if you think about wind speed forecasting or other things. So I think um, I, I was surprised that this came as such a massive surprise to the community. But to be fair, the community is basically uh, no offense, Robert, uh, um, you know, Makrodakis, um, uh, Files, Armstrong, Heinemann, who have been very skeptical about these methods, with Robert being the most sympathetic to them, really, for many years. So, uh, but that, that is a good, uh, good point with the Kaggle competitions, that others really have not looked to other disciplines, um, the data for to look at the merits. What really surprised me were two things in this competition. Um, first of all, it was hard for us to take part because you have to completely disclose your commercial product. So if you have any commercial interest of ever doing any consultancy work, that's kind of tricky. Um, but what really struck me is that that an undergraduate from Korea without any statistical forecasting background won the competition. I think I think there's an English saying, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. So there, there could be a, a level of randomness associated in winning this competition potentially. And if you think about that, it's been five and a half thousand submissions. Each person was allowed to make five submissions per day, which gives you a whopping three and a half million submissions that could potentially be submitted, although not all of them have to stand for the end. There could be a certain amount of randomness with um, contestants and submissions. But the other thing that strikes me is really that gradient boosting is doing extremely well, which has failed miserably in most of the papers that have tried to, uh, you know, be published in academia. I don't know what, what Roberts and Shawi's point is. That I know that they have evaluated uh, boosted trees, you know, random forest and so forth, and what their experience is. But I'm re I'm really surprised by by this. <laughs> so I'm I'm just overall with the competition. I think it's finally a great competition on a meaningful data set that's representative of a real world pro problem, not like the other competitions. Uh, but I'm really surprised by the results. So lots mm -hmm. of food for thought. So there's a, a, a lot of value in being surprised. I mean, just just one word. I mean, I don't re disagree with anything that Sven said. I think the, the forecasters um, have had reason to be skeptical of the machine learning community, partially because, for, I mean, extreme example being that bizarre Santa Fe competition. But uh, that, that essentially um, the uh, validation of the results was done so poorly. And, um, uh, and even I mean, the, the plus one uh, publication of Spiros pulls apart the, the work of a machine learning community in saying, oh, look, we've done well. And uh, so I, I think that's just a word of um, minor support for the uh, the, the neglect, because the neglect has been, I think, definitively shown to be inappropriate now by at first the M4 and the M5. And I think Spiros has literally eaten his words. And he, I mean, he to his credit, you know, he, he's been able to do that. Uh, I've been led by shall we to uh, be quite quite uh, supportive of the, the result. But I think um, there the, the really is an interesting question here. I, I don't know whether, shall we, you've uh, managed to look at that paper that I, I sent you, but it's about the, the, the randomness of results in competitions, uh, which I, I have to say I've not absorbed it. But clearly, as you've just de demonstrated, if you've got lots and lots of sub submissions from lots and lots of machine learners, just straight randomness will suggest nothing to do with the actual qualities of the, the method will suggest you'll have a ma machine learning or a group of machine learning winners. So we do we do need to take on board that in a horse race, there's always a winner. And it doesn't really tell you much about the, the future qualities of that horse race. That horse, I mean. 
I think that's well, obviously all good comments. Uh, we shouldn't probably forget uh, that there are two sides to these competitions. One side is that uh, indeed uh, we're trying to find winners, but in a way this is just to motivate people to participate. There are other questions they typically try to answer. So in the original M3 competition or M1, they wanted to see whether well, they formulated it as more complicated statistical methods, whether they perform better than simpler ones or not. I guess it all came to comparing ARIMA with non-ARIMA methods in a way. And so probably they're trying to test some hypotheses with M5 as well. So the question is what hypothesis and how useful they would be for the society. Uh, John, do you have just, a question? Yeah, just, just, a, well, just a brief comment. I'd be interested to see what Robert thinks about this. I think the whole idea of the horse race, I think I'm really following on from what you're saying, Ivan, it has some value, but maybe another value is rather than just thinking of this as a boxing max match between statistical methods and machine learning methods, is to think about, well, why are these machine learning methods doing well? And one of the things which is picked out in the presentation was this importance of cross-sectional estimation. And I think there's considerable scope for improving statistical methods in terms of cross-sectional uh, cross estimation. Of course, we're involved in some of that work already. I'm interested in Robert's take on that. And Charles, yeah, I, well, I don't think I have anything uh, profound to say. I, I, I think uh, an observation early on, and of course you've been involved in this, and the seasonality estimation, which is exactly that, really. Uh, rather casually in work that I published, I noticed that taking an average of an optimized parameter across the cross section produced better results. Uh, so the investigation of what exactly that is and what does the cross section have to be? Um, there seemed to be a, some evidence in M4 that it really didn't matter. That really is quite counterintuitive to me. So to take a group of seasonal products, you know, the Christmas baubles of various varieties and discover that actually a lot of randomness, but estimating the seasonality from taking the whole uh, set of time series, the bauble time series produces better forecasts. Now, that makes sort of sense to me. But actually, just to sort of, uh, you know, throwing in climate data and saying that helps, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. So that there is clearly some sort of degree of uh, investigation of, of, of that issue. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, Sven's uh, scepticism about um, the uh, regression trees and what it is about regression trees. Well, you were casting doubt on the evidence uh, Sven, but the earlier cargo competitions, as well as the M5 uh, competition, have all come up with these uh, tr positive tree results. And when I've looked rather casually at the literature, the tree results have always seemed to be uh, essentially dominant over uh, neural networks and uh, support vector machines, for example. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we th these now become stylized facts. I mean, my easy to make criticism, so I'll make it, is that um, the, the results aren't disaggregated enough. Uh, a paper that Shawi and I have published in EJOR, um, looking at machine learning methods um, against a variety of benchmarks, the most successful method most often was, guess what? Exponential smoothing. Uh, now, we could beat exponential smoothing in all sorts of ways overall, but if you wanted to pick a winner, you'd have still gone for exponential smoothing. I don't know how you would have picked a winner from the results of the uh, M5 competition and what, you know, <laughs> at random. You know, that, that's the, when I mean pick a winner, this is the method which uh, performed best on most time series. So uh, we need disaggregate results. Uh, Nikos has already made the point, which I wholly agree with, that um, aggregating up across uh, the cross section makes little sense. It doesn't make organizational sense, and I don't think it makes statistical sense. I wonder what the correlation is between uh, the unweighted average and the weighted average. Uh, the authors 
I'm being mean here because I think they've done an excellent job in many ways, uh, made the mistake of showing at one stage the results of the two, uh, the unweighted and the weighted side by side, a casual look. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a negative correlation, but it looked pretty close to zero to me. I may I may be wrong. It would be interesting to calculate. So, uh, yes, major benefits from the pooling, real question marks about what it is we're actually managing to get from using the re regression trees. I don't know whether anybody, uh, Errol, you're, uh, you've got some experience of this. Uh, I don't know whether you've used these, Sven. Other people with experience need to uh, explore that. I mean, shall we? You've probably got the most. Why do, why do regression trees work? Well, Sven, uh, you have uh, your hand, so maybe you can come. Yeah, up. I think Robert, that's exactly the question. We we have no idea why regression trees suddenly work, right? When Microsoft implemented regression trees into their their analytics services libraries, everybody was laughing at them because they. We, it's been well documented that even some of the more esteemed machine learning researchers couldn't get them to work for time series data because you're normally looking for correlated data, right? Of course, we know they excel at, at, at binary and nominal data. That's when they really are very good at splitting. Um, and of course, they use regularization, but they partition feature space orthogonally. So, so there's no way they can handle uh, correlations. Um, without getting too technical, um, it seems that this, this hurdle has been overcome by a combination of different approaches using uh, maybe different objective functions, using different splitting criteria, um, handling um, uh, handling, um, correlate, handling uncorrelated or correlated learning of, of many weak base learners across pool time series. But we don't really know what, what the contribution is. Is it just randomness? Is it, is it the pooling that drives accuracy? Is it, is it core entropy at the heart or, or some other splitting criteria? And I think that's the thing that's, that's unfortunately something we are not learning from the competition uh, because the, the submissions are also so diverse. But that's certainly, uh, there's an interesting strain of research that can come from this to really understand why something that fundamentally, theoretically shouldn't work it suddenly seems to outperform others. I have to point out that there is this child's hammer approach. Most of these five and a half thousand people who enter these Kaggle competitions are machine learners. And most of the time, machine learners use, well, their, you know, their, their favorite tool, which is, which is gradient boosting. If you don't know a lot about building models, you know, an undergraduate can build a good model with, with gradient boosting because they set thousands of meta parameters automatically. So yeah, um, they did. <laughs> and yes, and, and there's a bit of feature generation and then in the end, uh, something went. So I think that's what makes this interesting because suddenly an algorithm which we don't fully understand. I mean, I spent, uh, Devin spent, I don't think he's in the course, spent the better part of four four years plus postdoc plus i don't know to understand why boosting doesn't work right uh, surprising to see that boosting now suddenly does work um I, I hope he's not pulling out his hair um because we clearly missed something but uh, lots of interesting questions but i i do agree the insights are not there to to set a clear research agenda other than you know questioning what's going on Thanks for the comment. I think we would need to close uh, pretty soon well, because the time is running out. Uh, Errol, I see that you have a comment. Do you want to uh, vocalize it? Do you have this ability? Need to unmute, your, unmute yourself. I wrote, I wrote something uh, on the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the decision to simplify the model by creating rules like a fuzzy system. Uh, and in instead of estimating a function, uh, like in a neural network, uh, creating rules provides simpler optimization process. Uh, I think uh, because of this, the uh, gradient boosted machine uh, works better than the others. And of course, uh, bootstrap methods provides combined forecasts for uh, all trees. These are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Errol. Okay. Uh, any other final comments, uh, thoughts, questions? I think we can accept one more question. 
if oh, there is time, I can give one last one. Nikos, go ahead. Uh, maybe maybe I, can, I can give a, a slightly different tone on my comment, which is we, we surely have to accept that M5 has been fantastic in engaging a different community. And we have to take, given the audience in this uh, talk, I say we have to say there is, take the responsibility that at times we haven't been necessarily the most inviting community. Uh, we, we stick to our methods. And when other methods appear to be doing very well, we're always like, oh, but I knew that, or oh, but they're doing something wrong, surely. And, you know, there is a very good example of the lasso regression that statisticians still have an issue with it because it doesn't optimize the likelihood, which is silly. It just works well. XGBoost, we can say whatever we want about the first winner being random or not, but it's not random that a lot of submissions were XGBoost, and if you group them together, they still run very well. And there were some very good academic teams from the statistical world. Maybe they were not enough. Maybe we could have different mixes. But one thing we, that is apparent to me in this competition is that there is also a matter of, of language. For instance, we're talking about global, global optimization. Well, isn't that what some people have been doing already with multivariate models in statistics, which is done in hierarchical modeling as well? But we're getting lost a bit in the language. And this is where I would say that both or I don't know how many different disciplines come here, should, should talk to each other a bit more um, welcoming so that we get better techniques out there rather than saying, uh, no, computer science is better, no, statistics is better, no, forecasters are better. That, that makes no sense to me. Yeah, Could I, I then a uh, have a, a last comment? First, I, I hope you've uh, found it stimulating. I found it uh, stimulating to actually think about these. And I think uh, Speros and colleagues deserve a lot of credit for um, going in this direction. I mean, one of the things we've seen in the uh, International Symposium in the last, uh, uh, I'll include Rio in this, but certainly uh, Thessalonica before it, is the growth of machine learning people attending. You know, it's become now uh, not a dominant uh, uh, group, but certainly on an equal standing. Uh, I think, you know, from my perspective, econometricians have had a good run for their money. Uh, I don't know whether we've got anybody from the economics department here, anybody willing to put their hand up. Um, and essentially, the uh, engagement with the machine learning results will provide a very serious research agenda. We've just sketched out one or two questions, haven't we, which will be uh, worth a further study. And presumably people, some people are studying these things. Although the danger, as Nikos has just pointed out, is that you get in a particular um, rut. And of course, you've invested a lot in that rut. You've dug that root, that rut deeply and you don't want to shift that. E well, it's not that easy to shift either. So we need to be open to these results and try and understand where they lead. What they don't re lead here is solving the retailers problem. But that's another issue. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you for all the comments. Thank you for presentations, Robert and Xiaohui. And uh, well, I, I think that's it for today. Thanks, Ivan, for organizing it. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye.